It's good to be with you again. We're continuing our study on thriving in the midst of big trouble. You know, the last chapter, the last book of the Bible deals with tribulation, this great trouble that's coming to the earth. I don't think we're there yet, but I think we're walking through some of the precursors to that. We're seeing things happen in our world that will continue to escalate in intensity and in frequency. It's an unsettling time, but in the midst of that, we can flourish. We're looking into the Word of God to understand the pathway God has put before us so that no matter the turmoil around us, we not only live in peace and tranquility, we live with tremendous hope. I promise you that's a possibility. Grab your Bible and a notepad, but most of all, open your heart. We've been walking through this series about thriving in the midst of big trouble. Big trouble is just the, the plain language for the biblical word tribulation. And the New Testament concludes with this great tribulation, but the run up to that, and we don't really have an exact timeline. We all have some opinions, but no one knows with specificity. But, but the description of the things that, that, that will precede the great tribulation is big trouble. And it was introduced to us in a new way with a global pandemic that disrupted our lives and routines and our habits from which we haven't recovered. But I think we recognize at this point that the challenges are far greater than a virus from Wuhan, China. But we're not finished with the trouble yet. And as much as we would like to click our heels together and say we're back in Kansas where we were before 2020, our reality is different. Deception has flourished. Propaganda seems is exploding. Censorship is commonplace. Truth, as Isaiah described, it truly has stumbled in the streets. And the question is, what do we do? Well, the Bible hasn't left us without answers. In fact, the things I've been sharing with you for the past few months, we put into a book, which we're, will be released in a few weeks. But I've been doing interviews with radio stations across the, the country for the last few weeks, talking with, that, with Christian leaders about that in, in city after city after city. What are we going to do? And it's really not that complicated. The question is, do we have the heart to honor the Lord? And so I went back to Hebrews chapter 6. It's a passage by now I hope you're familiar with. The author of Hebrews says, let's leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. That's the goal, folks. We don't want to just get saved and camp. We want to grow up in the Lord. Amen. And I would humbly submit to you, it's time to grow. See, we want everybody else to change. We want the media to have a different perspective. We want the, somebody to have a different idea. We want something somewhere else to be different. But we have a very small imagination that we're a part of that equation. And the privilege I have is saying to you that the most critical component of change in the entire system is us. If we will humble ourselves and seek the Lord, we will see his deliverance. The Philistines didn't have the power to defeat the Israelites nor to the Midianites or the Canaanites or any of the other ites that occupied the region. If the Israelites' hearts were in the right place, God could deliver them, whether he did it with an individual with goofy strength or Gideon who was terrified that had nothing but a clay pot, a candle, and a trumpet. God knows how to deliver his people. And, and we have wanted to look through the windows and point our fingers. It's time for us to leave the elementary teachings and go on to maturity, not laying again. And now he's going to list six foundational doctrines. We said that Jesus is the foundation. But upon that personal foundation, your faith and mine begins with a person. His name is Jesus, not a church, not a denomination, not a translation. If Jesus isn't Lord of your life, you're not a Christ follower. You can be churched, you can be religious, you can be moral, you can be kind, you can be many things. But to be a Christ follower, Jesus is Lord of your life. The whole thing, you cannot segment it. Amen. But once we have come past that cornerstone, there are some foundational teachings that are necessary for you to be stable in times of turmoil. We haven't had to pay any attention to these because there's been enough stability in the systems around us. We didn't have to understand them. Never imagined churches could be closed. Never imagined that censorship would flourish. Never imagined if you didn't agree with an idea that was in the public sphere, they'd try to stop you and make you silent. It's a new day. Not a bad day. There's opportunities we've never seen. Six foundational doctrines, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. That's one of the faith in God. Two, instruction about baptisms. Three, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. Now, I want to take the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment and with God's help, walk through them this weekend. With God's help, we're going to do the resurrection of the dead in this session and eternal judgment in the next one. 
Don't look at me with that much skepticism. <laughs> this is doable. I think it's worth noting that of that listing of six things, two of them in total, and more than that, if you let me parse it out a little more carefully, but at least a third of them deal with eternity, with something beyond time. How many of you would say you spend at least a third of your time in reflection and meditation thinking about your relationship with the Lord beyond time? No. I bet 98, 99% of our thought around our faith is how to get what we want sooner than later. And yet when the author of Hebrews is talking to us about foundational doctrines, essential principles for stabilizing your faith, a third of it at a minimum deals with eternity. So there's a change of thought we've got to make. Remember, we're the ones that are, God's trying to change. So what I want you to know in this session and the next one, our topic is going to deal with eternity. And typically we invest very little thought there. Our effort and thoughts are almost completely dominated by issues of time. We're mad at the news. We're mad at the latest conspiracy theory. We're mad at the boss. We're mad at somebody. Our dreams, our aspirations, our ambitions are rooted in this present world order. Very little of our imagination, very little of our ambition is directed beyond time. The Bible invites us to something else. It says that's a childish, immature perspective to be almost totally focused in time. I did not call you childish. Yet. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 7, verse 31 says, this present world in its present form is passing away. It's temporary. Say, so, well, it's pretty relevant to me right now. I understand. I'm not saying it isn't relevant or significant. Your faith has an impact in time, but it has a far greater impact beyond time. 1 John 2, verse 17, the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So we have a little bit of a shift to make in how we start to build our insight and our understanding, our ambition, our dreams. We want to begin to contemplate eternity. Because when you think about your journey under the sun, your days under the sun, that little portion of your existence that's lived in time, is just a speck compared to your existence in eternity. Just a tiny little speck. It's like a, a, a grain of sand on the shore of the ocean. And we get all heated. This is the whole thing right here. This one grain, this is it. No. Sorry, Obi-Wan, the beach is bigger. <laughs> but we've almost totally missed it. We get mad at God. We threaten God. We withdraw from God. We're not going to follow God because I didn't get what I wanted on that grain of sand. And God's inviting us towards a little bigger perspective. Because we're so invested in time, sometimes it's pretty easy to get, to fall into the, the trap in our thoughts and our emotions of trying to time the market. You know, you want to sell at the right time and buy at the right time and, or how you manage the clock. You want to maximize every moment. I mean, there's libraries filled with stuff about that. And I'm, I'm all for being prudent with how we use our time. But from a biblical perspective, there's something I think we need to acknowledge and that there's, a, there's just a lot we don't know. And I, I say that as a pastor and um, I teach the Bible professionally and folks, there's a lot we don't know. We can build our charts and we can elaborate on our opinions and we can pound the podium. But oftentimes I think we miss the opportunities in front of us because we have focused more on the clock than on the opportunity of the season. Look in Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one is, uh, Luke wrote this, the gospel that bears his name, but the book of Acts is about Jesus' disciples after his resurrection. In Acts chapter one, Jesus has had 40 days with the disciples. He's gonna go, go back to heaven at the end of this chapter. He's had 40 days with them to talk about the kingdom of God. So. You got to think they had three years with Jesus watching him minister. Peter walked on the water, announced he was the Christ. They watched water turned into wine. They've seen blind eyes open, dead people raised to life. On more than one occasion, they felt a multitude, fed a multitude with just a, a little bit of food. They were in for the ride of their lives. 
And then they watched Jesus be arrested, betrayed by one of their own. And then they, they watched him go through a sham of a trial and then be tortured to death. It was unthinkable that the, the man who could raise the dead and walk on the water could be tortured to death. And they were brokenhearted. And then a resurrected Christ stepped into the room with them. I'm thinking there was a little emotion. And so at this point, now they've had several days, weeks with Jesus. So this is the, I mean, a tremendous amount of confidence, faith. Nobody like him, never met anybody like him. And they're going to ask him, it's the only question that we have recorded that they ask him. So you know it's uppermost in their minds. I mean, they've argued about who's the greatest and told him. They've come to him and said, we want to sit on the thrones next to you. I mean, they were pretty brazen. But this is post-resurrection. They got one question for Jesus. It's in your notes, Acts 1. When they met together, they said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to kick the Romans out? Is it time? Huh? You see, the hope in the heart of the first century Jewish community was that the Messiah would restore autonomy and independence to the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. Yeah, yeah, we've heard your kingdom stuff. Yeah, we got the resurrection thing. But is it time? And watch Jesus answer. It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Good old Middle Tennessee plain English. That would just be none of your business. But you will receive power with all, yeah, 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 power, witnesses, whatever. But are you going to kick out the Romans? And Jesus said, that's not really your business. It occurs to me that two millennia later, we spend a lot more time trying to talk about the time when he's coming back than we do being empowered to be witnesses. I know that's true. If I announce the topic and it's going to be about the timing of the end of the age or the, 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 the timeline for the book of Revelation and where, where all that's going to happen. I know what the, the, the attendance numbers do as compared to if we're going to talk about how we're going to be better advocates for Jesus. I didn't call you childish yet. John chapter 21. This is post-resurrection too. It's actually engaged with the reinstatement of Peter after denying Jesus multiple times. Jesus gives him kind of a personal pathway forward again. And at the end of that discussion, he tells Peter something about the end of his life. And after he says that to Peter, Peter has another question for Jesus. You got to love him. He can walk with both feet in his mouth. He's my friend. When Peter saw him, and that's John, he, he asked the Lord, what about him? He's just told him something about the end of his life. And so he says, well, what about John? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? In good old Middle Tennessee English, what did Jesus say? It's none of your business. You just follow me. So I want to suggest to you that when we talk about our journey through time, that it's so easy to become preoccupied with foretelling that we miss the opportunity in the moment. And I think the greatest challenges are the courage to say yes to the Lord in the moment. So I want to spend the balance of our minutes with this question, what happens after death? What's going to happen to you and me? Death is a part of the journey. When you got your birth certificate, you pre-registered for a death certificate. I know we don't like to think about it. It's unpleasant. We don't want it to come early. We all want to go to heaven, just not today. I think there's a country song. If there's not, there should be. If you put a dog in a pickup truck and it'll be a hit. But what happens after we die? Well, in Luke 16, Jesus pulls back a curtain a little bit. We get a little bit of a window into it. It's kind of a lengthy passage, but I think it's worth reading. There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. 
In hell, he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. And Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he's comforted here and you're in agony. Besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over there to us. And he answered, well, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, and let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they'll not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now, I just want to make quickly some observations. You can think on it and reflect on it at your leisure. But the first, there's no, there's no language used around that story that refers to it as a parable. So I don't believe it's intended simply to be a word picture suggesting some other reality. And then I would add to that, secondly, that the, the, the conclusion of it is noteworthy in verse 31. The response is that God's word is sufficient. That even if someone rose from the dead, that those who were reluctant to believe wouldn't believe. I, I want to encourage you not to be a reluctant believer. Don't champion skepticism. I don't want you to be gullible or naive or simple-minded. Folks, you, you don't have to check your brain at the door to be a Christ follower. In fact, you're going to need every bit of intellectual capacity that God has given you. But I promise you, God can stand the inquiries from your towering intellect. I mean, it's taken me a few years to figure that out. I thought he was kind of intimidated by university settings. Until you really start listening to what's pouring out of those places. So God said his word is sufficient. I would submit to you that the, day, the habit of daily reading your Bible, of submitting yourself to the authority of God's word in a systematic, routine way, I think it's even more valuable in community. But you don't have to read it with us. I think there's an opportunity in that. Is a very profound part of stabilizing your life in seasons of instability. But now there's some observations from that passage about what happens to us after we die that are worth noting. The characters that we're introduced to had persistence of personality. Neither person, neither the, the rich man nor Lazarus, lost their identity. They recognized one another. Four, there was a recognition of persons. They recognized one another. Not only they were still intact, they recognized other people. Number five, there was a recollection of life on earth. Both of them recalled the circumstances of their life in time. Number six, there's a consciousness of their present condition. The rich man is tormented and Lazarus is in a place of comfort. And they're conscious of that and how it was differentiated from their previous existence. Number seven, there's a complete separation between the righteous and the unrighteous. As we walk through this study on, on the resurrection of the dead and then eternal judgment, one of the things that will be repetitive is that there's really those two choices, the righteous and the unrighteous. We've created like 11 choices. But in God's sight, there's those two. Now let's walk this a little further around death and resurrection. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 57, this was Stephen. He's been recruited by the apostles in Jerusalem to serve the church. And he has been engaged in a debate that's going to result in him being murdered in the streets of Jerusalem. It says as they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now there's this change, and I, I don't have the time in this session to, to, to walk you through this fully, but Jesus' death and resurrection changed the destiny of our person after death. 
And what I wanted you to see was that the promise of the new covenant and what Jesus changed, the, the most decisive event in all of human history was the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. I mean, I earned a degree in history. There's a lot of things that have happened to change the course of nations and peoples and groups and the destiny of humanity, but nothing has been as significant as the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And again, it, we just haven't paid much attention. I was overwhelmed when I started pulling the scriptures together and looking at them. We, we can spend session after session after session just walking through the scriptures. And for the most part, we're just unaware. But Stephen says, as he's being murdered, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, don't hold this sin against him. And we'd said this, he fell asleep. I believe when Stephen's body ceased to function, that his spirit and soul went into the presence of the Lord. Look in Philippians chapter one, Paul says something, different context, but very similar. If I'm to go on living in the body, you see, you, your life isn't over when your body ceases to function. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in your body. Your body, I've often told you, to me, is just your earth suit. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna flourish underwater, you better take some equipment. If you're gonna live outside the atmosphere of earth, you better take some equipment. Well, the equipment God has given you to flourish in your journey through time is your earth suit. It gives you authority in this world. And you can use that to honor God or to dishonor God. Those are the two options. Paul says, if I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is by far better. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. So he said, there's something better for me outside of time. But for the time being, he said, there's an assignment for me that requires me to stay present. You know, the Hebrew word for the, 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 or the, the biblical words for our destination after death in Hebrew is Sheol and in Greek is Hades. But again, Jesus' death and resurrection changed that. So it's a bit beyond the scope of this particular presentation, but we'll look at it in some more detail. The resurrection of Jesus is our guarantee of our resurrection. Colossians chapter one and verse 18 says, he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything, he might have the supremacy. Jesus is the head of the church. You know that, right? Not pastor, not the board, not the presbytery, not the denominational executives, not the bishops. I mean, all of those offices are fine with me. I'm not saying they're wrong or evil, but ultimately Jesus is the head of the church. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, I will build my church. He's coming back to the earth for his church. Amen. You want to be an advocate for the church. Not perfect because it's filled with people. The only way to have a perfect church would be to get rid of all the people. I didn't call your name yet. Okay. But Jesus is the head of the church. And then it says to us, he's the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. You know, my father was a veterinarian, most of you know that at this point, but I, I got to participate in the birth of a lot of things. And do you know the, the, the first part of the body to present at the birth, if it's a healthy delivery? The head. And the head is the promise that the rest of the body's coming. And I assure you that when the head was raised to life again, it's the assurance that our bodies are gonna be raised to life again. We don't think about it very much. We don't talk about it very often, but it's a very important point. Look in Philippians three, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly body so that they will be like his glorious body. We're gonna get a new earth suit. And, and literally, if we translate that last phrase where it says our lowly bodies, it, it, literally it says our body of humiliation. Now there comes a point somewhere along your journey through time, <laughs> you turn that calendar enough, your body is a humbling thing. 
If you haven't gotten there yet, just trust me. And the truth is, no matter what your age is, it's the truth. And you can eat the, the most lavish meal prepare, prepared by a team of iron chefs. Or you can fry spam and eat it on a saltine cracker wrapped in Wonder Bread. <laughs> and your body's going to process those two meals the same way. There's something in that that should humble us, no matter our sophistication or our educational advancement or how delicate our palate may be. No matter how articulate you are, what your IQ is, if you, if you are engaged in much activity in the Tennessee summertime, you will perspire. And if you move very fast, you're going to sweat. You're not going to glow. You're not going to glisten. You're going to sweat. And if you stay with it, you're going to smell. There's something about our bodies that are intended to remind us of our creatureliness. But there's a point ahead of us when we're going to get a transformed body. Post-resurrection, Jesus was not bound by the things that bind us. He still ate. But he could step into a room when the door was locked. He did some remarkable things. He's going to transform our body of humiliation because it's been humiliated by sin. You know how messed up we are? We dabble with sin. We entertain sin. We think sin will make us fulfilled. It'll make us content. So we're rebellious. How much can I incorporate and not forfeit too much? How far is too far? How much is too much? Folks, sin is humiliating. Stay as far away from it as you can. If you have given in to temptation, succumb to it. If you've given it a foothold, repent in humility. Step away from it. Change your thoughts and your behaviors. It will not lead you to a good place. Look at 1 John 3. Dear friends, now as we are children of God, what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, when Jesus appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. If you are truly hoping for the resurrection, John says to us that we will be purifying ourselves. We'll be doing everything we can to diminish the influence of this present world order in our thoughts and our behaviors. So may I ask you a question? Do you have that mark in your life? See, we've lived so presumptively. The focus of our faith has been on reciting a prayer and getting a dip in a pool and then sitting around church from time to time when it's convenient. But we really weren't thinking about our life beyond time because everything was about what we could get our hands on or enjoy or experience or do. So we really haven't had any motivation or very small motivation to live with eternity in mind. Not to live out of time, we've got an assignment here. But while we're here, our goal is to, on a daily basis, choose to purify ourselves. Amen. Less of the world in me. And if you imagine that you will participate in the resurrection and you don't intend to purify yourself, you're deceived. I don't care what prayer you prayed. I'm not done, I think I can support it biblically. What will our body be like? This is a fun question, 1 Corinthians 15. Someone may ask, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow doesn't come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you don't plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. Now, it seems to me there's two things being presented in that passage. It's an agricultural image, metaphor comparing a physical resurrection of our body with what happens when you plant a seed and something grows. Two ideas are being presented, one of continuity and one of change. This isn't complex. Continuity is that if you plant an apple seed, you're not going to get a lime tree. That the seed indicates the kind of life that is going to emerge from that seed. The change is that there's a, a tremendous change in what the seed looks like and what is planted and the life that comes after it. Something spectacular beyond the seed. You with me? Yeah. I like watermelon. Yeah. Yeah. And I know with, with a little scientific help, there's fewer seeds. But you remember those black seeds in the watermelon? Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, you're better than me. I'm sure you never spit them at anybody else, but, but you have to admit it's pretty spectacular that you could take that little black seed and put it in the Tennessee clay and get something as colorful as a green rind, red watermelon. Who would look at that little seed and go, oh, I know what that'll be. Not unless you've had some experience, you don't. Well, that's the imagery that Paul is using about the resurrection. He said, our body is sown one way, but we're going to be raised to a whole new kind of life. A whole new set of parameters. Why would we purify ourselves? Why would we long for his appearing? Why would we try to separate ourselves from this present world order? Because there's something so much better ahead of us that we want to be invested in. Now, why is this necessary as a foundation? Because in the midst of turmoil and confusion and stress, it's easy to be filled with despair and hopelessness and grief and anxiety because you see the things that you thought would fulfill you moving further and further away. The systems are less stable. And we want to be very aware that our hope is anchored beyond time. Now you've got a message for people that are walking through difficult places. Now you've got a voice of hope. You can sit there, you may cry with them, you may weep with them. You don't have to have a solution to every problem. You can say there is a hope beyond the suffering of time. The importance of the resurrection. We're gonna do this, hang on. Again, it's the most decisive event in the history of the universe. Changed everything. It really did. I'm sorry we haven't thought about it more. I, we should have talked about it more. We will. I promise. Jesus' resurrection is the basis of our justification. If Jesus had been raised to life again, we got no hope. Amen. I tell you that because that's not widely embraced across the spectrum of the church. You can find many voices of authority and influence and power and significant education that will not embrace the physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I'm very difficult to engage in a theological argument. You can disagree with me, I'm happy for you. We're all entitled to an opinion. God's given you the ability. If someone has a sincere question, I will sometimes have that discussion. But I'm truly just not interested in a lot of debate. But I'm telling you, what you believe about the resurrection will determine your destiny. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says, He, Jesus, was delivered over to death for our sins. I usually like to take the pronouns and make them personal. He was delivered over to death for my sins. And he was raised to life for my justification. So if he wasn't raised to life again, I have no justification in God's sight. Big religious word, to be justified means to be just as if I'd never sinned. How do, you, how do you stand before God without guilt, shame, or fear? Only through faith in a resurrected Christ. There is no other way. There is no plan B. It's why the uniqueness of Jesus is essential to our story. All faiths don't lead to the same place. All beliefs aren't the same in outcome. There's a tremendous reluctance in the American Christendom to talk about the uniqueness of Jesus. Look at Romans 10, familiar verses. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. His resurrection matters. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Jesus' resurrection is the basis of our justification. Amen. Now let me add one more idea to that. His resurrection is the completion of our salvation. It closes the circle for us. Philippians chapter 3, this is the Apostle Paul. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Now, most of us, you can get a big amen and I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. We all want the resurrection power of Christ coursing through our veins. The fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, you pray that for your neighbors. 
becoming like him in his death. I don't believe it's calling us to be martyrs. In his death, he was fully yielded to the will of God. But it's the next phrase that intrigues me. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. This is the Apostle Paul with this extraordinary revelation he's been giving of Jesus and his redemptive work. And he's well into his life and his ministry. He's not just an angry young man at this point. And he's writing to the church at Philippi, which he has shepherded into existences and coaching along in the midst of some predatory attitudes towards it. And he said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so that somehow, whatever means possible, I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. We have not lived with that attitude. That's not been the overwhelming attitude in American Christian. We've lived far more presumptively. Do you believe you'll be? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Certainly. No question. Piece of cake. Well, how do you know? Well, I, I walked the aisle. I, I did that. I, I worked at two hoedowns. I worshiped outside for a year during that pandemic thing. Have you ever seen how long pastor's outlines are? I've sat through hundreds of those. The font type is microfiche. Somehow, he said, but he's not done. He said, not that I've already obtained all of this. This is the apostle Paul. Not that I've already, it's not like a done deal for me or I've already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, if we take that larger passage, somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead, this one thing I do, he said, I'm going to forget what's behind. I'm going to press on. I'm going to strain towards that objective. Seems to me we've been a little passive. A little smug. Maybe a little self-righteous. Maybe a little critical of others or condemning of others. Thank God we're not like them. You know, Jesus told the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector who prayed in public. And the Pharisee said, I thank you that I'm not like all these sinners. And the tax collector wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. Remember the story? And said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said that the tax collector went home forgiven and the Pharisee didn't. Again, in a season of shaking, we don't want to be the group of people saying, thank God we're the good ones. I don't want you to live in fear of your salvation. I do want you to live with the humil humility and the, the determination to give God your best. There is something ahead of us that is better than anything offered to us in time. Amen. Now, what are you living for? What are you dreaming about? What are your ambitions linked to? And I know we're in church and the answer is Jesus, but I mean in the quiet places of your life, in the prayers that you're offering. I'll tell you how you, you unpack that and get to the root of it. What are the things that cause you to be agitated, aggravated, frustrated if they look like they're being delayed? That'll help you find the things that are the most valued in your, your priorities. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. That's the best solution for our world. It's the best promise for you, for me, that somehow we might attain to the resurrection of the dead. We're going to get an upgrade, folks. Amen. It's not a burden being a Christ follower. People say, you know, what, what do you have to give up to serve Jesus? Nothing. Nothing. There's a joy in our faith, an anticipation in our faith. There's a promise in our faith. If you'll meditate on the resurrection of Jesus as the first fruits of what is ahead for you and me, and it doesn't bring a new purpose and a new joy and a new hope to your heart, don't stop thinking about it until it does. 
It'll make it much easier to say no to ungodliness. It'll make it easier to, to make the, the determination to begin to purify yourself in places where you haven't been willing to. We've tolerated rebellion. We to, we've, we've tolerated too much. We've been a little passive. But God is awakening us. God is awakening us. And we're not going to stop. I made it. You watched a miracle. You watched a miracle. I want you to stand with me. I want to give you an invitation. Our numbers are such tonight that we, in this session we can do this. It'll take a little humility. But if you would be willing to say to the Lord, or if it's true of you, you don't need to say it if it's not, that I'm one of those who's been a bit indifferent. I've had a certainty about my faith and I haven't been overly concerned about the rest. I've been a little passive. I've been a little casual. Purifying myself has not been nearly as much my focus as accumulating or achieving or accomplishing whatever the, the dream of the week was. If that's you, and as we have walked through this, that you have felt the, the Holy Spirit inviting you to a different response, I want to give you an opportunity just to, to signify that before the Lord. It doesn't have anything to do with those of us in the room, but I think those public acknowledgments of the Lord and our willingness to give him our best matter a great deal in our lives. We can't always do that because of circumstances, but we can this, in this session. So whichever room you happen to be in on campus, I'm just going to invite you forward. If you're in three crosses with me, you can come forward right now really quickly. If you're joining us digitally, you can just type it in. Say, I need to respond to that. I'm not going to wait long. If that's you, come quickly. And there's nothing unique about the front of the room, but there is something significant in saying to the Lord, I'm willing to be different. We're going to kneel when you get here. So if you want to go ahead and kneel, you can start that. You start to tell the Lord. It's between you and him. It's not about me. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. But... And again, if you're a new harvest or all nations, you can come forward in there and kneel. And if you're joining us someplace else, you can kneel right where you are. Folks, God's people are the ones he's calling. He'll, he'll use your life and our lives to reach other people. I believe that. I'll, I believe we'll see a moving of the Spirit of God but it'll be birthed out of the renewal in our hearts and our lives. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and its truth and its power. I thank you that you love us and you have called us out of darkness into the kingdom of your Son. And Lord, we have responded this evening to acknowledge the, the inconsistencies of our own hearts. Lord, we have been tempted, and distracted, and influenced by the, the opportunities of this present world order. And we come tonight to humble ourselves and to ask for your mercy and your forgiveness as we repent. Give us your thoughts. Father, open the path before us that you've called us to and created us for. Give us a joy in serving you. I thank you for it. I thank you that you're a God who delights in showing mercy. Lord Jesus, you have loved us. You gave yourself for us. You offered yourself as a sacrifice. You didn't defend yourself or retaliate. You took the punishment that we deserved, that we might have the blessing that you deserved. And we come tonight to say that we want to honor you with our lives. We don't want to hold anything back. No thought, no behavior, no attitude, no habit. There's no resource. There's nothing in our possession that we want to withhold from you. Jesus, be Lord of who we are, all that we have, and all that you've created us to be. May you be pleased with us. Holy Spirit, help us to forget what is behind and to press forward for that which is ahead, that we too might attain to the resurrection of the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. You better give the Lord a hand, huh?
Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content, when we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.